Welcome back, traders and investors. We have Nick Fenton on the line, and he is the founder of Ticker Tank. Nick, how you doing on this Friday morning? I'm doing great. Thank you very much. How are you doing? We're doing good. Uh, tell us about Ticker Tank. So Ticker Tank, it started off as a little bit of a variety pack, uh, day trading, swing trading, options trading. But my my main wheelhouse basically is options trading, high probability options trading strategies to be precise. Um, <clears throat> what I noticed over time, you know, having owned the business, you know, testing the waters at first, but the majority of the interest was, in fact, in the options trading. And since that's what I primarily do, I just decided to make Ticker Tank 100% options trading. So. Basically, the, the premise behind Ticker Tank is high probability uh, options trading. You know, we're, we're selling premium on uh, underlying, highly liquid underlines that uh, are trading at or near 52 week highs as far as the implied volatility goes. So, you know, trading high implied volatility, looking for faded decay, aka time decay, um, and trying to keep price out of the equation as much as possible. Okay. So that's, that's the primary, the primary, uh, idea of ticker tank you know we use a lot of different strategies that we can discuss if you'd like okay no that's exactly what we want to go into i i mean you know you're you're selling premium here when and you're trying to predict when implied volatility is at or near a high now we know that sometimes you can get a spike in volatility and it can just keep on going uh what what uh, what do you use to determine that it's at the top of a 52-week range? Are you looking obviously you're looking at a year of data, but uh, are there any other factors that uh, come into your decision? Certainly. So back, let's see, about 10 years ago, when I started doing the style, this particular style of trading, um, I would specifically look at the implied volatility chart, and I would focus mainly on a 52-week period, but you know, sometimes I'd go out a little further. And generally, what you'll see is implied volatility stays fairly range-bound. And when it gets towards the top end of its range, you're, if you're selling premium, you're putting yourself in a more probable scenario that that implied volatility is, in fact, going to go lower. Of course, there's always a chance that it could go higher. But given what I've seen in the past, and you know, if, you just, if you look at several different implied volatility charts, you'll notice that it's pretty consistent that when it reaches its you know, at or near its top end of its range, it tends to either sit there for a while or pull back. Uh, it's very rare that it continues to move higher. I mean, you will get cases like we saw in UNG, uh, like I said, it was late 2013, where the implied volatility spiked significantly before falling back into its range. But aside from that, the majority of the time, if you're saying when implied volatility is at the top of its range, you're putting yourself in a very probable scenario that the implied volatility is in fact going to drop. Okay. Um, now let me let me just say this real quick. My primary my primary objective when whenever putting on an options trade is fade to decay. So time decay is, is number one primary objective. Secondary objective is volatility decay. And the least um, the last thing I'm worried about is direction of price. Okay, do you have a particular group of stocks that, that you follow or do you just wait for you know, stocks to fall into your trading setups? So, yes, I do have a particular list that I tend to trade most often, but anything, any underlying that has what I deem liquid options associated with it, I'll trade. So, if I see a situation, you know, if I see an opportunity in an underlying that is trading with implied volatility at the top end of its range, then and you know, I determine that the options are in fact liquid, I'll go ahead and trade it. It might not necessarily be in my list of uh, regular traded stocks, but it doesn't mean that I won't trade it. Okay. Uh, give us some of those stocks that are kind of in your wheelhouse that, uh, you know, you kind of follow more than I'd, I could. If I had to guess, I bet you it's some of the higher price, high, higher beta stocks. Well, not necessarily. It's just the stocks that, that have extremely liquid options associated with them. So, I mean, your standard ones, which the opportunities to actually sell premium are rarer than regular. I mean, standard are your ETFs like IWM, uh, SPY, TLT, which is the bond ETF. And then you know, you got your sector-based ETFs like XLE, let's see, XLS, XLU, XRP, stuff like that. Individual stocks 
uh, Yahoo, Microsoft. You know, I like to trade uh, EWZ, the Brazil ETF, GDX, SLV, um, Pandora is a pretty, a pretty decent. It's got local options associated with it. has some decent activity. Uh, and then, of course, Google, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, like you mentioned, the higher price, high data stocks. They're also, uh, they're also tradable, but what you'll notice is a lot of times the, you know, the bid ask spreads on the options of those higher price stocks is significantly wide, as it should be on these higher price stocks. Uh, it's, it's tightening with time, but the volume and open interest is, is very high in those. So I'm pretty comfortable um, with the wider, you know, with the wider bid ask spreads because of the fact that the volume and open interest is there in a significant way. But generally, I like to stay with the stocks that have really tight bid ask spreads in their options, uh, or the underlying, I should say. So 10 cents or, or less is my preferred bid ask spread in any given underlying. Okay, and then those other ones, you, what do you do? You just stick your price out there and say, come and get me instead of, instead of waiting for the bids and offers to come to you. You just put your, your orders out there and say, come and get me. That's exactly right. So, um, you know, say, for example, I do like a short strangle in Google or an iron condor for you know, people that may be more familiar with that particular strategy. Um, you, what I'll do is I'll build a spread and I'll look at what's known as the mid mat spread so you can look at the liquidity of the specific leg, but then when you build the spread, there's going to be liquidity associated with that actual spread where it takes into account the liquidity of all the legs associated with the spread. And you can look at what's called the mid mat spread. So you'll see the natural price and the middle price. And what I'll do is I'll try to stay as close to that middle price and realize as little slippage as possible. Uh, basically, like what, what you just said. I'll start at the mid and I'll say, hey, market, come to me. You know, maybe I'll trickle down a couple cents um, if I'm noticing that I've had the trade working for, say, 20 minutes or so and I haven't had any luck. I'll trickle down, you know, a couple cents and, and uh, give them a little bit of leeway, but there's kind of a stopping point where I say, okay, enough is enough. If it doesn't go here, I'm not going to do the trade. Uh, and also, I mean, besides, uh, you know, making your trades when implied volatility is, is, you know, what you consider at the top of the range, are you also looking for a particular catalyst in the stock? Many of our guests, they come on, they do trade the options market, the weekly options. They have their strategies, but they're always looking for a particular catalyst, perhaps something like earnings. Uh, is, that, is that part of your strategy, or you just take up the setups when they come, and regardless if there's a potential catalyst for the stock? So my primary, my primary trading method is duration-based where I'm avoiding earnings. I'm trying to stay a month or more outside of earnings. You know, I'm looking for somewhere between 40 and 70 days until expiration with an expected holding period of, say, two to three weeks. Um, what I'm selling for credit. You know, say I'm selling a short strangle for a dollar. I'm generally looking to get about 25% value decay from that dollar. So I'm looking to cover at about 75 cents and realize, say, $0.25 cents per spread, so $25 per spread in, in profits. Um, but I do also trade earnings. I just trade earnings in smaller size. So, for example, yesterday I looked at, uh, you know, the, the earnings landscape. I didn't really like anything, uh, but I ended up trading this ATHN, Athens, and I did a 108.150 short strangle, which based on the current price, Pre market of 127.60 is going to work out great. So I did a two times the expected move short strangle. Google would have been a, a great opportunity if it would have. Uh, Google's typically a great opportunity, but yesterday I didn't deem it as a good opportunity because the expected move was only about 4% the price of the stock. And I wasn't comfortable doing an high condo or a short strangle or you know any other one of these credit style strategies that I tend to do into earnings because I didn't think the expected move was high enough. So to answer your question, yes, I do trade on earnings-based events, which is a binary catalyst. Aside from that, that's really the only binary event I tra I'll trade around. I don't look for any news events. I don't look for any, like, phase three uh, approvals in, in uh, pharmaceuticals or, you know, any biotech stuff. I pretty much avoid pharmaceuticals and biotech. <laughs> Uh, that's probably good because uh, a lot of it's dependent on the outcome of drug trials and FDA. Uh, so let's just talk about a few of your strategies here, um, how, what you expect to get out of them. Obviously, you're going short strangles. 
Uh, you're just hoping that the stock stays within a particular range. Uh, just going to the short stringers, I mean, are you putting, do you have defined risk reward ratios when, when you put these trades on and these spreads, or is it uh, pretty much all or nothing? Because you are selling, you know, you're on the selling end of things. So theoretically, you know, your risk could be pretty high. Absolutely. So <laughs> to answer that question, I have specific criteria for every strategy that I do that needs to be met. So, for example, on a short strangle, as you just mentioned, it isn't a theoretically undefined risk trade. Um, but you can give yourself an idea of what the probable max loss is by saying, okay, I'm comfortable with defining my risk at a one standard deviation move, or maybe it's a one and a half standard deviation move, or maybe it's a two standard deviation move. So let's say you deem a two standard deviation move as a highly improbable event. Therefore, you look at your max loss as what would my losses be at a two standard deviation move if that was to take place. So you can, you can define, determine that two standard deviation move, see what your max loss would be on the upside or downside, and make that basically your defined risk. And then take a look at what your profit objective is and you know, divide that in order to kind of get an idea of your risk reward on that particular scenario. Generally, when I'm doing these short strangles, I'm going to be risking a lot to make a little, you know. So in, in the ETF, for example, I'll risk as much as 30 to make one, which sounds completely counterintuitive to human nature, but your probability of success is so high that, you know, I mean, you, you win a, a significant portion of the time. And as long as you, you know, manage your winners, take profits when the prop, a reasonable profit opportunity presents itself, you're going to continue to take these profits over and over and over again. And, and, and also, on the flip side, you have to make sure that your losers don't get too out of control. Um, so, so my criteria for short strangle, for example, you know, I'm looking generally for a one standard deviation move on the put side and the call side uh, as far as the legs that I'm actually selling. I'm looking for a month that is 40 to 70 days from expiration, you know, I like I like between 50 and 65 days is my sweet spot as far as when I'm entering. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I'm also, of course, looking for liquidity. Liquidity is king. I mean, extremely liquid options. Uh, I, I want to avoid the earnings risk. I prefer ETFs over individual stocks so that there's some diversification built into the underlying. Mm -hmm. But I do trade individual stocks. And, you know, I just prefer if there's an ETF, you know, if, I, if there's an opportunity to sell a strangle on IWM, versus Apple, I'm going to go with IWM 100% of the time. Uh, and explain volatility skew spreads. How and when do you use them? So volatility skew spread is essentially when you take a look and you determine, so you take a look at the closest to the money strike. So let's say the closest to the money strike is, let's say this underlying trading at 100, just to keep things simple. So the closest to the money strike is obviously going to be 100. Let's say we go five strikes away on the put side. Uh, so we'll go to 95 put. And let's say that 95 put is trading for $2. And then let's go five strikes away on the call side up to 105. And let's say that 105 call is trading for $1.50. So we've got a $2 put and a $1.50 call, both at the same amount of distance away from the money. So the, the put is richer than the call. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll, I'll sell, maybe not that specific call, that's just how I determine which side is richer. I sell naked the side that has the, more, you know, the, the richer premium, and then I sell a, a credit spread on the side that has less rich premium. It's also known as a J. Lizard, the uh, KC trade. Have you heard of KC trade? Yep, definitely have. They, they, they made that term um, fairly popular, but this is, it's originally known as a volatility skew spread. So you, you find where the skew is in the volatility, you know, which side is richer. You sell naked the richer side, and then you sell a credit spread on the side that has less premium richness. And as far as which strikes you choose, it's really based on... So um, if, I'm, if I'm selling a put and I'm selling a dollar-wide call spread into it, Generally, I'll look for a put that's like 70 to 80 cents, and then I'll look for the call spread that is going to make up the difference 
to make the overall credit a dollar or more. So if I sell a put at 70 cents and I'm trying to get a total credit of one dollar spread that's 30 cents or more because you know if I, if I get more than a dollar then I have zero risk to the uh, to the upside and only risk is to the downside and I can actually make money on the upside if I get more than a dollar. So it's it's a really interesting spread. It's hard to describe um, over the phone. It's, it's it's much easier to get like, a real visual perspective of it. Okay. But um, it's very powerful. It's it's something that I've had a lot of success with, and it's really amazing how quickly you'll you're able to achieve profits if you if you if you do this the right way. I mean, if you approach it the right way, you're using liquid on the lines and, and you're selling them at the high volatilities. You know, very you know extremely high, and you're selling with the proper amount of uh, duration in the options. You can you can really see some of that faded decay and volatility decay take away pretty damn quick, and it's it's impressive. It's it's a really attractive strategy. Okay, we'll have to uh, follow up and learn more about that strategy. We've had Nick Fenton on the line, the founder of Ticker Tank, uh, giving us his outlook on the options market, selling implied volatility when the premium gets high. Nick, thanks a lot for coming on. We'd like to have you on again real soon. Absolutely. Thank you very much for having me. You guys have a great day.